when I had the opportunity today, I thought, let's go back to that book and we'll go to the beginning. The book of Malachi takes place probably around a thousand years or maybe a little more after the book of Exodus, which is where we have been studying lately. And um, um, I wanted to tell you the story this morning. Well, a couple of things first. I was back there uh, looking through my notes, kind of thinking through, getting my heart ready, and then Carlene came. <laughs> and tried to mess with my head, and she figured that spot where I was, when she came by, it would throw me off. And uh, it probably will, so we'll, we'll see. Some of you may know of Eric Riddle. Uh, Little, he was born in 1902. He was a Scottish missionary in China. At age five, he was in a boarding school in London. He went to Oxford College. He was a famous sprinter, the 100-yard dash, and he did it in uh, 9.7 9 seconds. It, it was a British record that he set that would stand for many decades. He was known as the Flying Scott. In the 1924 Olympics in Paris, he had been chosen, he made the team, to run in the 100 yard. It was one of the biggest events in the games. And the person that won that race was, and still is, considered the fastest man in the world. So he was not a normal sprinter. His form was difficult to watch. The paper described it as probably the ugliest runner who's ever won an Olympic championship. In Paris, when people from around the world came and saw him, because previous to this, he'd just been in, in England and in Scotland, they, they laughed at him. And one of his rivals said, people may shout their heads off at his appalling style. Well, let them. He gets there. Sunday, July 6th, 1924, the stadium was packed. He was not suited up. But they were there for the event. The, the 100 was taking place that day. He wasn't warming up. He wasn't on the track. He wasn't in the stadium. He was down the street preaching in a church because he wanted to honor God. As a devout Christian at that time, his convictions would not allow him to run on Sunday. So his best event that he was a, a shoe in to win the gold medal was on Sunday and he chose not to run the race. He opted out actually weeks before because he knew what the schedule was and he decided instead that he would run the 400. It was not his event. He was not a world-class runner in the 400. It wasn't a short sprint, it was a longer sprint. It was four times as long. He was marginal in it, but he did qualify for the Olympic tri in the Olympic trials and it was a different race. I have a coach that helps me with cycling, and there are different things he has me do in preparation. And you know that we have built into our, an energy system and a muscle system that can go all out for about 10 seconds. That's the length of the 100. And then we have another energy system that can go uh, fairly strong for, he'll have me do maybe 30 to 45 seconds. And then after that, we have energy systems that let us work all day and, and keep on going for the long haul. But we can't do that all-out effort. So here's a man who was very good at an all-out effort at 100 yards, now going for the 440. It was known as the dreaded long sprint that nobody wants to run because it required a sustained effort beyond what your sprinting ability would allow you to do. In 1924, when they lined up for the race, they went around the bend, and you had to stay in your lane the entire race. And so they staggered the racers because when you're going around the corner, the people on the inside didn't have as far to go as the people on the outside. And for the 440, Eric was on the outside. So he started in front of everybody else. And it's a disadvantage because you can't see where the other runners are. And right next to him was the man that the same day had set the world record in the semifinals for the 400. And so he was asked what he was gonna do in this race. He said, I'm gonna run the first 200 as hard as I can. And then the second 200, with God's help, I'm gonna run even harder. <laughs> so he's in the outside lane, he's getting ready to run, and he takes off and he's out front. And you know that, that previous to the race, Scottish bagpipers were outside the stadium and they played the bagpipes for an hour in honor of him and, and to encourage him. And as he was ready 
to start the race, somebody came along. All right. There it is. Part of it up. But somebody came along and handed him a note that said, those who honor me, I will honor. One of his teammates who knew that he had honored God. So he led early. Halfway through the race, he was three yards ahead. He didn't weaken. Everybody was trying to catch him. And with his head thrown back and his arms kind of clawing the air and his knees that they said would come up almost to his chest. And it was interesting because I saw the video of the actual race. And the track was almost cinders. It, was, it wasn't a hard track like we have now. It was sand. So they were, it was almost like they were running in sand. But he came across the tape and he won the race. And he set a new world record. It's called one of the 50 greatest moments in track and field history. It's captured in a movie some of you may have seen, Chariots of Fire. He is quoted as saying, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. Is there anything in your life that when you do it, you feel God's pleasure? Maybe for Brian's preaching, I'll bet Brian also when you're out on your bike. When we're on our bike, we feel God's pleasure. Yesterday we were on a hike in the woods and looking at these tall trees around us and we could feel God's pleasure. In our service to God and in enjoying the world around us, we ought to be able to feel his pleasure. So Eric returned to Britain and he was a hero. And not too long after he returned, he announced that he was going to retire from running. Now, he was the top, one of the top runners in the world and had a great um, chance before him to set more records and to gain a lot of fame and to make some money and to do well. But he retired, and he said he was going to become a missionary. He said, I believe God made me for a purpose for China. And so he returned to the small village where his father had worked, and he continued his work. When he was asked in, in succeeding years, did he ever regret giving up the fame that he had, he said, it's natural for a chap to think over all of that sometimes, but I'm glad I'm at the work I'm engaged in now. A fellow's life counts for more, far more. A fellow's life counts far more at this than the other. This is what my life is about, he said. This is what I've committed my life to. He served faithfully for 20 years in China, and then there was a world war, and he was in a Japanese concentration camp. Five months before the liberation, he died of a brain tumor. His last recorded words are these, it's complete surrender. He was a man of a single passion who offered his life as a sacrifice to God. There are two movies about him, Chariots of Fire and one that Debbie and I saw a few months ago on Wings of Eagles that tells about the last chapter of his life leading up to his death. He lived and died to see God's name lifted high. He understand and he understood that there's more to life than what is here and now, more than what we can see. There's something more. And there's a part in you and there's a part in me that knows that there's something more than what we can see. In Ecclesiastes, we find these words. God has set eternity in our hearts. God did something when he created us and put something inside of us that said there's more to life than just what we see. There's something beyond what, there's the, beyond what we see. There's a power beyond us. Romans says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly perceived, being understood by what has been made, so that they are without excuse. The point of it is that you can't walk outside on a starry night or walk through the woods like we did yesterday and see the beauty of creation and not say, how did this get here? Something greater than us is behind what we see. So he's saying that we're without excuse to seek out God when we see what's going on in the world. We are just a small cog. Did you ever see that picture, the pale green dot? There's a picture taken, I don't know how far away from Earth, long way away from Earth. 
and you see a huge part of the universe. And there's one little pale green dot in the midst of all of these planets and stars. And we are on Earth on that pale green dot. We're just a small cog, and God is great. And since the very beginning, human beings have been trying to figure out how to know God and how to please him. Cain offered sacrifices and his harvest, but he didn't follow what God ta taught him to do, and he did it wrong, but he was trying to please God. Aaron made a golden calf. The Canaanites put their children in the fire in order to try to please God. The prophets of Baal cut themselves. The people of Athens even made an altar to the unknown God. Throughout every age, in every culture, as human beings, we've made an attempt to how do we know God and how can we understand him and how can we please him? Because our insides tell us there's more than just what we see. There's something else that we need to know and be connected with. A.W. Tozer wisely said, man was made to worship God. At the heart of worship is complete surrender. It's more than singing songs. It is a part of singing songs. It's more than coming together in corporate worship. It's showing up, the more than showing up here, it's giving ourselves completely to him. It's to relentlessly pursuing knowing God. Philippians says, more than that, I count all things to be lost and view the surpassing value, knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, from whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them mere rubbish so that I may gain Christ. The psalmist said, one thing I have from God that I seek, that I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. It's worship when a life prizes God and places God above all else to live this type of devotion. It's the high point of every human being. But when we look at our lives and when we think about our lives, we know we don't always live up to that. We're not always as faithful as we ought to be. We get busy, we drift, our passion wanes, our hearts can grow cold if we're not careful, and our worship can become careless. In the book of Isaiah, God says, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Jesus said they worship me in vain. And he's talking about this very thing, that we've lost that, uh, that ability or that, that commitment to prize God above all else, and we begin to let the fires burn out. Is it possible that worship to God might cause him to close his ears and turn his back and reject the offerings that are made? I think it's possible for worship to be that way. For worship to be done in such a way and be so careless and to have such lack of devotion that God says, I don't want to see it. Shut the doors. I'm turning my back on you. That's exactly what was happening in the time of Malachi, in the book that we're looking at, in the chapter that we're looking at today. The people of Israel were still coming to God. They were still offering sacrifices, but God rejected their worship, and we'll read about why he did that. Malachi 1.10 says, Oh, that there was one among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle fire upon my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. I will not attempt an offering. I will not accept an offering from your hand. Can you imagine? God's saying, somebody shut the door of the temple. I don't want to see what's going on. Somebody put out the fires for the sacrifice because they're in vain. There's no meaning. They're, they're not the kind of sacrifice that I'm asking for. They had drifted so far, they were so cold, they were so comfortable, that God actually hoped someone would come and shut the doors to the church and not let anybody in because he wasn't being honored by what was taking place when they came together to worship. God indicts the people of Israel for being lethargic, for uninterested, for being lazy in their worship. So our theme as we work through Malachi is that there is just this overwhelming spiritual apathy. It was pervasive in the time of Malachi. And I think it's up to you to think through how is it in our world today. You can ask yourself, and I think we should from time to time, are there any symptoms of 
spiritual apathy in my life? Am I really living in complete surrender? What are the areas of my life where I'm not? Am I just cruising, just comfortable, consumed with lesser things? Well, let's read the text of Malachi, beginning in the first verse. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have, I loved, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says they may rebuild, but I will tear down and they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. A son honors his father, a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? God's saying, if I, a, a, a father will love his son, and a son will honor his father, if I'm your father, what are you doing to honor me? Because I don't see it in what's going on here. And if I'm a master, where's my fear, says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name? But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food on the altar by saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? When you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us with such a gift from your hand. Will he not show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there will be there were among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. From the rising of the sun to its setting in my name, I will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name. And a pure offering for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted, and its fruit, that is, its food, will be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is, and you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. Listen to the way they're acting and responding to God. You bring what has been taken by violence, or is lame, or sick, and this you bring as an offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. God is saying, cursed be the cheat who says, oh yeah, I've got a really good ram here, the best one I'm going to give to God. And then he doesn't. He takes one of the weak ones and offers it. So there's some major themes here that we're going to look at as we go through this chapter. One begins by saying, God says, I love you. And then secondly, they have forgotten who God is. He's no longer great among them. A couple times in the chapter, God says, I will be known as great among the nations. You've forgotten all about it, but the nations will recognize me. Third thing is they will not give God their best worship. Their worship isn't costing them anything. They bring their sick, their lame, their blind animals for sacrifice. It's not the best. They defame the sacredness of God in his temple. They give defective sacrifices. They do not really give their service to God. There's no Eric Riddle type of sacrifice or life among them at this time. Now, the truth is, the, the book starts out by God saying, I really love you. They sin by doubting that, but he says, I love you. Now, Carlene, this is the spot where you tried to mess with my mind. Sharp as a tack here, I'm right on target. You're, you're not throwing me. Okay, but so, so keep up the efforts. <laughs> maybe you'll be be, maybe have better luck next time. 
Um, and by the way, and this is a great way to get your name in the sermon and out on Facebook. <laughs> so God dearly loved them. He said, I love you. And then he says, but I know you have a question in your minds. How have I loved you? You're looking around at what's going on in the world. They've been through, um, they've been dispersed. They'd come back to, to Israel. But things were not, Israel was not, they hadn't made Israel great again. And it wasn't the same as the country had been. And they're looking around at what's going on in their world. And they're saying, God, where are you? You, you say you love us, but you haven't made Israel great again. So do you really mean it? Have you really done it? And the first evidence of God's love was God declaring, I love you. God is love. God is truth. And unlike you and unlike me, God doesn't lie. When God says he loves us, he really loves us. There's no question about it. And then he recites history. He goes back to Esau, and, 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 um, and remember when he says, I hate Esau? And it, it, the point is that he doesn't hate Esau. But if you go back into their history, when the, uh, Esau went after the blessing of his father and deceived his father, and then he was separated from the people of Israel, and he became the leader of the Edomites. And they had their own land. They were across the river. And God says, look over there. Look at them. Look at the Edomites. They violated me. They violated my trust when, they, when, uh, when Esau uh, led them off. And I'm not blessing them. But if you look at Isaac, I am blessing him. And, and Jacob's line had been blessed. So he gives an example then of a father and a son. They're the son. He's the father. A father loves the son. The son's responsibility is to honor his father. So at the beginning of the last book of the Old Testament, the first verse said the oracle. It simply means the message of God as it comes through Malachi. And as it begins, God says, the first thing I want you to know, you're a bunch of prodigals. You're walking away from me. You're wandering. You're not honoring me. But the very first thing I want you to know is that I love you. I've been thinking about you. You're on my heart and mind, and I love you. And they're thinking, oh, we don't get it, God. Life has been pretty tough, and our country is been having a difficult time. Remember last week, Book of Exodus, Pastor Brian talked about the new Pharaoh, the new king that came in, one who did not know Joseph. And so he didn't know the history. And he instituted new rules and new laws, and he made life difficult for them. It's unsettling when changes take place. And great changes took place that cost them a lot. It cost the Israelites a lot. It made me think of a country that I know, I'm very familiar with, where leadership changed, and things have changed, and in some ways it's impacted my life. When a new guy took over for in the book of Exodus, the new guy took over, he changed things, it affected people's lives, it made their lives more difficult, it shook them up, it put them under bondage. Did that change anything about God's love for them? Did somehow God not love them as much as he had before? Did anything change about God's promises to them, even though they were living through a time of difficulty? Was God asleep at the switch? Was God like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. I didn't realize that Pharaoh was going to come along and, and he was going to lead, he was going to cause all this trouble. Did, did, was God somehow unaware and caught asleep? Not at all. The problems that in, they faced were largely, they were to blame for. Because they had become weak, because they had not been strong in their commitment to God. After a generation or two of not passing on the values the, the word of God, the scripture, the teaching, the things that are right, the rules, the laws of God. After a few generations go by where those are not passed on to our children, then they'll pick up whatever the world teaches them. I think it's the same sort of thing happened in the country that, I, that I'm familiar with, that over a few generations, 
we didn't teach what we needed to teach and we weren't strong about it we didn't pass it on and the values of the nation changed but God wasn't caught off guard my dad was a pastor and there was a story he used to tell about a section of the coast that was subject to shipwrecks and some people that uh, survived a shipwreck decided they would set up a life-saving station and so they got a boat and they built a little shack and when and they would watch when there were storms and when there was a shipwreck those that were gathered there and had joined in this cause get in the boat and they would head out to sea and they would save the people involved in the shipwreck and those people rejoiced and some of those people gave money to help them buy a bigger boat and they wanted to have a bigger shack and over time they wanted to have a bigger clubhouse and they built this clubhouse and over time they wanted to have social activities and they would have dances and they would have fundraisers and they were busy in the clubhouse and so much focus got put on the clubhouse that they forgot they were a life-saving station so the few of the people from the beginning went down the coast a little ways and they built another shack and they had a boat and they worked at saving those who were lost in shipwrecks and over time it grew and more people got involved and they wanted a bigger shack and they wanted bigger boats and they wanted a clubhouse and pretty soon their focus was off so a few of the people left went down the beach a little further built another shack got another boat it's the kind of thing that can happen to us in the church it can happen to us as christians where our focus gets shifted over time on other things that that have value but that keep us from our primary purpose and then we're not passing on and we're not teaching and we're not upholding the things that are right and true and then we become weak and that's when hardship happens that's what they were missing out on because they had gone weak but the thing is God is telling them I love you and there's some truths about God's love the first is God's love is unconditional it's an act of pure grace from God it's not dependent upon anything that Israel done had done and for God to love you is not dependent upon something that you have done or that you will do or it's not taken away because of something that you have done in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 7 the Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were numerous more numerous than other peoples you were the fewest of all peoples it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you uh, this is a spoiler alert right now for the book of Exodus um, but when it says uh, re redeemed you from the land of slavery and the power of Pharaoh the king of, king of Egypt because in Exodus right now the, the, the hammer's coming down on the people and they're being put into slavery but God is saying I've loved you from the very beginning I chose you it was an act of God to choose you Deuteronomy 10 13 yet the Lord set his affection on your ancestors and loved them and he chose you their descendants above all the nations as it is today God's love is unconditional it was for them and it remains so today for us it's not based on what you've done or what you will do and he doesn't take it away because of what you have done or what you will do God's love unconditional second God's love was sovereign God chose them why did he choose Abraham there were things about Abraham that caught God's attention and God chose him and he promised to Abraham and to all his descendants that if they followed him he would bless them it was a sovereign act of God it was a God thing God's love for Israel is an everlasting love the book of Isaiah says but Zion Zion said the Lord has forsaken me my Lord has forgotten me can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb even these may forget yet I will not forget you behold I have engraved you on the palms of my hand your walls are continually before me it sounds like a lasting love to me God says I've engraved it I, I don't know if there's such a thing as 
tattoos in heaven, but uh, God, basically it's tattooed on God's hand. That I, it's right there, God said, in front of me. And it will never go away that I love you. And that love that he had for them is a love that's passed down for us. Same everlasting love of God. In the, the book of Romans, in chapter 8, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what's, what's the out there? What's the loophole there? Where's the way for God to get out of loving us in that? There isn't one. There's nothing. Tattoos still on his hand that I love you and I will not forget you. You are mine. Another thing about God's love for Israel, it's like the, he says it's like the love of a father for a son. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? If we are the children of God, if he is our father, if you are a child of God, and the Bible, the scripture tells us, we're a child of the Most High. What are we doing? What are you doing to honor Him? There should be some evidence in your life from time to time that He is your Father because of the way you're living your life in honoring Him. Malachi goes on to say, They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possessions and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. So he, now he's talking to people who are very unfaithful to him. He's talking to a group of people that he said, if, if I could, I wish one of you would just shut and lock and bar and chain and nail shut the doors of the church because I just I can't stand what's going on in there. That's the group of people he's speaking. And then he goes on and says to them, they shall be mine. When I make my treasured possession, I will spare them as a man who spares his son who serves him. And then to us, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now Malachi goes on to address the sacrifices, and I need to wrap this up in a minute. There's just a thing inside me. Ever since um, when I was doing the book of Malachi and, and Brian, you were gone, Pastor Brian was out of town, and, uh, but uh, Marcia was here, and um, in my first sermon out of Malachi, she said, you know, you were within 10 minutes of uh, breaking Brian's, <laughs> Pastor Brian's record. <laughs> so I tried, and the next one didn't quite do it. And I know I've got another chance today, but I'm not going to try and go for the record again. Uh, I'll save that for another day when, when I've had my Wheaties. Uh, <laughs> but worship is holy. Worship is sacred. Offerings that they made, whether it was in money that they gave, whether it was in animal sacrifices, it, when we give to God, whatever we give to him, or whether it's a, our, our time and our service, it's sacred and it's holy. Coming to the Lord is sacred and holy. Vows and decisions of faith to follow him, to be dedicated to him, to fulfill certain things for him. It's sacred and it's holy to serve God. If we violate those vows we make to God or influence someone else, it's a tragedy. And it need not happen in the church. Even though most of our sacrifices to God are material in nature, I mean, when, when you give time or abilities, it's a sacrifice. Our offerings to God show our heart. It shows what's important to us. If God's important to us, if, if he's ranked high on our priority list, then we give to him and we give of value. These people were offering, they were giving something that didn't cost them anything. The animals that they couldn't sell anyway, so let's take those and let's give them as the sacrifice. To love God is to value him more than anything else in the world. 
more than our lives, more than our possessions. If you value God, you give your best. Jesus was watching at the temple when people were giving their offerings. And they were coming by, and some of them had large bags of money, and they were throwing them in the offering receptacle, making sure that it clanged loud when it hit the side so that people knew what they were doing. And then a widow came along and threw in two coins. And it was more than what she had. And Jesus said about her that she had given more than all of the other offerings put together. Because those two coins, that was all she had to live on. But she valued God. To some, even large amounts of money have little value because it doesn't cost them something. We give what costs us. I began with the story of Eric Little. His life was a sacrifice of the best of himself. He gave up some things that were good in order to have what was best. God deserves our best. He deserves our offerings. It's giving him a part of our lives. Do you know, if you drop something in one of those offering boxes and it took you an hour of your life to earn it, do you know you just gave an hour of your life to God? You just gave an hour of your life to God. If you get involved in the cleanup day or some of the other activities, helping fix food, and we're doing it to honor God and to serve people, and it takes a few hours of your time, you've just given a few hours of your time to God. He deserves our good service, and it takes time. Debbie and I had a recent discussion about this idea of service. At the end of 2019, we sold our counseling practice in Illinois. And, and at the end of 2020, we moved here full time. We spent a couple of days a week uh, doing video sessions, counseling sessions uh, from our home. And then we've got the rest of the week. And we could spend the rest of the week, especially around here, riding our mountain bikes, riding our road bikes, uh, on our snowshoes, on our cross country skis, on our fat bikes on the trails, hiking the trails, going to the lakes, paddling our kayak and our canoe, fishing. We could spend all of our time doing that, and that would be fun. And we do get some of that in uh, almost every day. But we're also saved by Christ. We are also equipped to serve. He's given us specific gifts just like he's given you specific gifts. And he's trained us to serve, and it's what we're here to do. We have four children that are married. We have 13 grandchildren. We had four of them here. They were here with us last week. And God has called us to serve our family, like he's called you to serve your family, to encourage those four families, to invest in those grandchildren. And so every couple of months, we head south for a week or two, and we spend time with them and invest in them. Occasionally, we bring some of them up here, spend time with them, and invest in them. I had a couple of significant talks with Pastor Brian over the last few months. He asked me to seek God in terms of serving, to cover some bases, and just take some time and pray about that. And I, the minute he asked me, I already knew the answer. I'm to serve where I'm planted. And this is where I'm planted. And wherever you're planted, you are to serve. We're called to serve, to give God the best that we can give. Now, what I like about this church, one of the things that attracted me here, a couple of things. We're going to have a potluck in just a minute. The very first Sunday we came here as visitors, like the first year of the church, there was a potluck, and we were invited to stay. And so that's just kind of, that's one of the things that's a part of uh, this church in my mind. And if you're visiting today, you're invited to stay. There's usually plenty of food, and everybody likes to sit and hang out and talk and fellowship with each other. But another thing about this church that stands out to me is it is a serving church. 
most of the people here not only serve here within the congregation, but there are many who have places of service in other organizations outside of the church. If you're not serving, if you're not giving God your best, then let him speak to you about that about what you ought to be doing and what you could be doing and how you could use the gift that God has placed within you to serve him, to honor him, to give him your best, to earn his favor, to be an act of worship to him and a service to others. During World War II, England was running short on coal. Winston Churchill called together the coal laborers and their leaders to enlist their support. At the end of his message to them, he painted a picture in their minds. He said, when this war is over, there's going to be a parade in London. And first in that parade will come the sailors who kept the sea lanes open. Then will come the soldiers who've come home from Dunkirk and then went to defeat Rommel in Africa. Then will come the pilots who drove the Luftwaffe from the sky. And then the last in that parade will be a long line of sweat-stained, suit-soaked, streaked men in miners' caps. Some from the crowd will cry out, and where were you during our critical days of struggle? And from 10,000 throats would come the answer, we were deep in the earth with our faces to the coal. Not all jobs are prominent and glamorous that God has asked us to do. Sometimes we're in a pit with our face to the coal. But he's called us to serve. And it's our job as members of his family and members of this family, or if you're a member of another church family, to help God accomplish the purpose of his church through our serving. There's a song that you're all familiar with that I asked Debbie uh, to sing. and She's going to come, and I think you're going to help her out with that right now.
Okay, so hello. Most of you know me. I'm Chris Westland. I'm with Phil. And <laughs> I've been here at the um, Oaks for a long time, five years. And even when it first started, I was at one of the first prayer groups ever that began the Oaks. So I love being here and sharing what God has been doing. Um, I'm the executive director at a new pregnancy center in Ashland. And we serve Ashland and Bayfield counties and the surrounding areas. We just got a new logo, if anyone can see that. Does that make any sense to anyone? Can <laughs> Do you wonder, what is that thing up there? Can you see the cross? Yeah. Yep. So this is like, kind of like the first aid, or what is it, Red Cross? It's like, we're here for you. Most people don't see the cross right away, but um, it's there saying Jesus loves you and welcomes you into our place. Um, so we're going to play a little video just to show you how far God has moved already. It's amazing. Some of you actually are volunteers there, my right-hand girls. Um, and so here's a v our tour. one of the registered nurses here at Chuamican Pregnancy Center and I'm also the board chair. I am so excited to announce that we just had our ribbon cutting here at our new building at 200 Chapel Avenue. Come with me as we do a virtual tour and I'm going to introduce you to Cindy, our client manager. Hi, I'm Cindy, the client care manager at the center here. At the center, all of our services are free and confidential, and we do offer pregnancy testing, ultrasound, abortion information, educational classes, and we have a boutique full of wonderful items that people can earn for free. When you first come to the center, this is where you'll be greeted, and then we'll go on back to a client room. This is one of the client rooms we have at the center here. And this is where we would meet with a client to have a conversation about how we can be of help and assistance to them at this point in their life. And now we can show you where our ultrasound room is. Hi, 
Eva again here. I'm in the ultrasound room. Here is where we will be able to give a limited ultrasound to our clients to verify inner uterine pregnancy. We have our brand new machine here, the Minery DC40, which has the capability of doing 3D and 4D for our clients. Now I'm going to introduce you to Chris Westland, our executive director. Welcome to our boutique. I'm Chris Westland, the executive director, and what you're seeing here has all been generously donated from our community. All of the items here are provided free of charge for our clients who go through our education program. So we will be heading in back into the reception area. Follow me. Thank you so much for coming on the tour with us. We have worked so hard and are excited to serve our community. God's heart breaks for people and we are there to help them. Um, many of you, you guys helped paint the walls, that was fabulous, and um, help bag up baby clothes. I look around and so many of you donated items for the boutique, given financially. You guys helped start it. Your prayers of support and encouragement have done this thing with God's help. So I just pr applaud you all for supporting us. It's not done. Now the battle begins. The spiritual battle is really fast and furious um, on the front, front lines. Um, we're getting hammered pretty good with the liberal, you know, um, agenda and we're there to help moms and dads grandmas and grandpas um, raise these families and be strong support for them um, some of you may have gotten in the mail we were going to do a fundraiser and now because of the um, increase in uptake of illness in the area we're postponing it to the spring but we had an exciting donor step up to give $25,000 match for our capital funds campaign, which is super exciting. So I've got some things on the table. Um, I don't want to have to raise money. I'm sick and tired of talking about it. <laughs> Brian doesn't want to have to say, hey, we need money to pay for our electric bill. That's the last thing we want to even think about. We want to help these women. We want to help these women. So we're having a capital funds campaign to pay off our mortgage because I don't want to have to think about it. We have a job to do. We had a woman come in for three hours on Wednesday, broken. She left after we prayed with her and talked with her and listened with her. She left and someone I knew saw her come out of the building carrying some baby supplies with a huge smile on her face. That's what we're doing. That's what God is doing. He's bringing hope and joy and peace that only he can bring but he uses us to do that so thank you for being the body of christ <laughs> and doing and and having those little feet right where you're planted in this in this area it's amazing so i just want to encourage you to help us meet that twenty-five thousand dollar match um so we can just serve the women we just we're, we're just so blessed and, and they're finding freedom in Christ. That's what we're there for. 
It's it, yeah, it's about okay, we can give them some clothes, but really the freedom in Christ is why is why we're standing there in the gap and as well as you guys please continue praying for this ministry. Um, so there's flyers and stuff back there, but I just thank you so much for what you have done already. So thank you. Thank you.